Hi, hi. Hello. Can you Richard. Hi there. Dr. Hanny. How you doing? Oh, yes. Uh, the doctorate is right around the corner. Oh, I'm really? Doing great. Um, yeah, so it, it isn't, by the way. It, I'm not becoming a doctor anytime soon. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm I believe for in a you. Master's degree. Thank you. That, that is, that is uh, very, um, how do you say it? Um, comforting? No. Um, flattering. Flattering, yes. It's um, uh, uh, well earned. You know, my, my community doesn't normally get behind uh, discussions on political affairs in other countries, but they took tremendously to that Golden Dawn video all the way back. So chat, for those of you who don't know, um, uh, Professor Dr. Mr. Hannay, um, the okay. man to whom we were speaking, uh, we spoke with him on the fall of the Golden Dawn Party, the Greek Nazi Party, um, some time ago, and he wanted to come on, and I wanted him to come on, to talk about the state of affairs in Ukraine, yeah? Yes, because um, I am a, I have studied military history, so the whole, you know, Ukraine war thing, uh, when it broke out, uh, it was of great interest to me, and I had a few conversations with uh, Rose Wrist before, uh, before it was breaking out, and I told him in January, I'm like, okay, it's like 60-40, this thing is going down. And then on the, we last spoke on the 22nd, of February. And I told him, it's going to happen next week. <laughs> I'm like 90 some percent sure it's going to happen next week. And uh, yeah, that was, uh, I, I like to, I predict things, but I only predict bad things. So that doesn't make me happy, you know, like I'm happy I predicted it correctly, but then I predicted the humanitarian disaster of unimaginable scale. So, hey, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, what can you do? The, the curse of prophecy. Um, the invasion began while I was in a bar, uh, getting shit-faced, so I was, I was, uh, unprepared as well for the, um, you know, the, the execution of my, um, my, my prophetic expectations. Uh, now, people in my community might be surprised to hear this, but just mm -hmm. because I'm not actively covering the Ukraine war does not mean it's not still happening. Actually, events continue even when I don't provide daily updates on them. Uh, I can see they're surprised by this. Um, which is why oh, yeah. I'm glad to talk right? about it. Yeah. Oh, you know, I was saying unbelievable, right? Oh, it, yeah. Oh, no. It, uh, it's inconvenient, it's, too. Continues, yeah. What the hell? It was supposed to be done in a week, you know? So, where are we? The most recent thing that I remember uh, with regards to the Ukraine war is that mm -hmm. America airdropped some giant missile trucks into Ukraine, and with just a handful of them, Ukraine has been liquidating um, ammo depots and fuel depots anywhere near the line of conflict and also killed a few generals with them. And that seemed cool. Yeah. So that you, you're talking about the HIMARS systems. Yes. Uh, we're going to get to the, we're going to get to the HIMARS systems very quickly. I actually made a presentation and oh. do you mind me actually turning on my camera? No, um, no, I trust I you. My own. All right. Thanks. There we are. Let me pop out video. There we go. Hello. They say hi. Hi, chat. All right. Let me let me put. I have chat on my screen as well. Yes, you can see all the frogs they're posting then. Oh yeah, I I see the frogs. Yeah. So uh, I was watching a little bit earlier uh, what you were talking about. You know, you were talking about uh, Americana and like the big malls and stuff and uh, veganism. And uh, yeah, as you couldn't tell, I'm, I'm from Greece, you know, so uh, it's hard to be vegan here. Have t very tasty gyros. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, it's that's a very compelling argument against veganism. You can't have gyros uh, in any reasonable vegan approximation. Very difficult. Yeah, it's, it's really difficult. So let me turn on uh, the presentation here. So I'll share my screen, basically, so you can see the presentation and we'll go a bit over what uh, I think we should talk about a, a brief, very brief summary of what has happened so far and where we're going from here. Does that sound good? Absolutely, please. Perfect, beautiful. Let me, how do you, yeah, share my screen. All right, let me, I turned on the presentation. There we go. Chat, we're here for it today. All right, there we go. First of all, I'm plugging myself because I didn't do that correctly last time. So 
there you go, chat. You can now follow me on Twitter and on Twitch, where I actually do more regular updates of uh, uh, what I, goes on in the war. I didn't know that you had a Twitch. Yeah, I made it uh, recently. Um, and not too recently, but I recently made uh, Affiliate, which uh, makes me happy. That, uh, that slaps. Congratulations. Um, yes, thank you. Got the, you. I, you I use the donor my... buttons and the, the sub emotes and everything. Yeah, I need to fix all that. Like, uh, my, my setup is really bad in, in general. <laughs> so I, I really need to get going. I mean, my camera is literally my phone. It's just my phone. So, yeah, I could be doing a bit better. Uh, and my lighting, as you can see, is my screen. That's why I'm white right now. It's from the presentation. So this um, is from your uh, phone? The, the video feed that we're getting of you? Yes. That's, that's pretty good for a phone it, feed. You're, it's doing its job. Yeah, it's not bad. I, I didn't expect it to work that well, but it, it did. So I'm happy about it, you know. All right. So, um, yeah, just very briefly ab about me. I just to finish this, I studied military history and I'm going to study. Uh, I'm going for a master's in security studies uh, pretty soon. So that's the expertise I have. I don't actually have um, confidential or internal information. I don't have any insider information. So I'm only doing analysis, you know, to the to the extent that I can. Uh, you might, you know, end up disagreeing with me, and that's fine. Please don't uh, come to my house and kill me. Uh, it, it, no, nobody is a hundred percent on point about everything in this war. It's actually a pretty confusing one. So I'll I'll be doing my best. Uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, pretty difficult, I think, to get perfectly reliable information on any conflict, especially one that's currently ongoing, and especially especially one where the primary um, sort of operational strategy for one side seems to be online disinfo spreading. You know, that's, it does, does make things yeah. a little tough. Yeah, I'm going to mention a bit about the information war. Um, so, okay, uh, here. So basically we have, I'll talk a bit briefly about the early war, notable moments, uh, the Battle of Donbass, the information war, HIMARS, because people really like HIMARS, uh, strengths and weaknesses of uh, Russia and Ukraine in, for, in continuing this war, and foreign support, because it's important, as we'll see. So, uh, okay, wait, actually, yeah, before I go into that, so what has happened so far, right? We saw a really big, um, what I would call Zerg rush from the north, from Belarus, and from uh, the northwest of Ukraine. So if we open here uh, the interactive map in Live UA Maps, mm -hmm. we saw a big invasion in this area of, uh, of Ukraine. Where they got in cut. The early days. Yes. So the reason why they failed here is because the Russians were under the impression, for some reason, that if they basically rush into the country and, and hit Kyiv, they would basically, the Ukrainians would fold and capitulate, basically how it happened in 2014. Uh, and they were wrong, which, which, uh, which turned out really bad for them because they didn't have enough forces to actually take Kyiv. They had maybe 30,000 troops on one side and another 20 on another. So it, they didn't actually have the forces to take a 3 million people city. It, you can't do that with... 20 with 50,000 soldiers, even if you don't, you know, count rear security. Yeah, basically, I what they did. Oh, oh sorry, yeah. Go oh, ahead. no, not at all. I just remember the very early on in the invasion, they kept sending these doomed VDV paratrooper expeditions to try to take the airport. What was it, Hostomel, right outside of yes, Kiev? Yes. So, so they could land more people in, and it just kept failing over and over and over again. Yeah, so basically they, they did these attacks where every time they ran into an obstacle, they went around it and they, they ignored the rear security, hoping that they would capitulate the Ukrainians. So basically they held these, uh, these thin strips, parts of roads leading to Kyiv, but they never actually held the inside territory, which is why we saw so many videos in the early war of uh, convoys being struck all the time because the Ukrainians in the rear just turned around and said, okay, well, you're not going to take out the positions. We're just going to walk around with uh, our javelins and we're going to hit your uh, dumb columns moving without rear security. 
So the Russians, after a month of this clown show, realized mm -hmm. that they couldn't really take Kyiv and they were at a dead end here. So they decided to withdraw and uh, get rid of their flashy tactics. And they decided to go back to what has worked for them in previous wars after the fall of the Soviet Union, which is basically indiscriminately bombarding the ever living crap out of everything that stands in their way. So yeah, the they classic. basically moved, yeah, they basically moved the action to Donbass. They had managed to, to secure a, a foothold in the south. Uh, so that part of the early war actually went very decently for them, and especially because Ukrainian defenses around Kherson collapsed very quickly because they were caught off guard and because Mariupol got surrounded. So very briefly, uh, what happened, you know, siege of Mariupol, uh, it went for a went for quite a while, uh, but the Ukrainians really didn't have a, a solid chance of actually making it, you know, out of there. The, the Russian buffer zone was too thick and they couldn't be resupplied. And eventually, you know, we knew it was going to fall, but uh, it actually took way more than most people expected. So that was at least good because it held up quite a few forces uh, from, you know, moving north and cutting off the Donbass, which was this early um, fear that, you know, uh, the Western analysts uh, were looking at. Mm -hmm. So uh, the... I wanted to briefly touch on the uh, Kharkiv and Kherson offensives. So the Kharkiv offensive uh, went down, uh, I think it was in uh, in in I th either May or June, I'm not 100% sure, but it wasn't that huge a deal. It captured a bunch of territories north of Kharkiv, uh, but it didn't afterwards it's just Russia. So they basically pushed the Russians back from Kharkiv and there were pretty light forces here. And they established a bridgehead in Stary Saltov with the hope of cutting off the railway that supplied the Russians at Izium. But this didn't actually materialize. So basically the Ukrainians pulled back from Stary Saltov and this has, and the you know, the supply line here basically remained secure for the Russians. So that's the a brief summary of the Kharkiv offensive. And the brief summary of what has been going on in Kherson, it's actually kind of muddy. We, we don't 100% know. But the Ukrainian of offensives that we were seeing, um, you know, over the past month, they didn't actually get very far. And a big reason for why that is, uh, is the there isn't that many forces here on either side, and there's rough parity in numbers, which means that, you know, you're, you're going to have a hard time pushing against numerically similar opponent that has around the same amount, if not more equipment than you. And, and it is should dug be, in. I mean, even this, like, the exceptional on Ukraine's end. I mean, Russia is getting bogged down in a conflict like 50 kilometers from their border with every possible, you know, numerical advantage entering into this conflict. So even, like, the idea, like, you know, it's like, well, this city's lost, you know, maybe this front is lost. I think most reasonable estimations of how this conflict would play out before it actually did play out was that Kiev was fucked. Or at the very least, oh, yeah. like, East Ukraine would be bowled over in very little time. Yeah, yeah, people thought that uh, the Ukrainian army would roll over, but... I think that was a bit of an overestimation of Russia and an underestimation of Ukraine. Uh, we shouldn't, you know, completely flip the script, you know, and, and it is completely discount Russia's ability to still do damage. Uh, but I think before the war, uh, Ukraine had something like 50 brigades, a an army bigger, I think, than Turkey, uh, bigger than Poland, bigger than, uh, than Germany and France. So Ukraine was actually really well like equipped and prepared for such a war. Uh, they had been preparing for eight years, of course. So they were they were ready to fight. And the Russians, that's why they completely miscalculated in that early part of the war. Um, yeah, so I wanted to briefly move to, to Donbass since we kind of talked about this part, because I think Donbass is probably going to be the most interesting part. It's uh, it's what most people have been talking about, you know, uh, 
in in because the the focus of the of the Russian uh, you know war effort moved towards uh, fighting in in Donbas. So what happened? So when the after the the big pullout basically from from Kiev, uh, we'll, we'll, the the announcement of the Battle of Donbas happened on April nineteenth. So the map looked something like this. So if you see the, there isn't a huge difference between now and and what was then in 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 July. Sorry, yeah, in April. Sorry, April nineteenth. But what happened is basically in stages. Uh, there is a river here, the infamous now Seversky Donetsk River, which runs something like this uh, over here over this way i think yeah something like this anyway so a bit further back maybe perhaps here but this river uh what it did is it it, it was an obstacle for the russians to move further south and they but at the same time the russians hoped that by moving towards the river they would prevent attacks on their flanks towards Izium. So they basically uh, focused on that. And at the same time, they had this like grandiose plan of encircling Lysychansk and Severodonetsk. This didn't actually quite work out because if we go to the presentation here, uh, their, their big push for doing that happened in May. So on the 7th of May, if we go here, 7th May, what happened? Popasna fell. So this was the first, you know, kind of big news coming out of this operation here. What was the significance of the fall of Popasna? If we go on the height map here, Popasna is on a height relative to the rest of this area. So the Russians were able to use Popasna to uh, leverage their artillery and hit Ukrainian positions in their rear and whatever they could see from the height of Popasna. So what their hope was is that, okay, we're going to burst through Popasna, and at the same time, we're going to do this pontoon operation in Bilohorivka with a hope that we're going to encircle the Ukrainians. But that didn't quite work out because Bilohorivka was a massive failure. If you remember, we saw those pictures of the hundreds of, not hundreds, the dozens of vehicles destroyed and laying in the in the fields, uh, right and, and right on the pontoon bridge that that got set there. So the Russians found themselves with half an operation. So what they did is they revised and they said, okay, well we didn't take Bilohorivka. What are we gonna do? So slowly, they tried to push out from Popasna and towards Severodonetsk. So we see here that they kind of expanded the area that they held around Popasna. And by doing that, they started threatening the rear again of Lysychansk and Severodonetsk. They basically put it in, in uh, something of a cauldron. So they, they tried to do this to cut off, but then the Ukrainians again pulled a fast one on them. What happened? The Ukrainians set up a defense anchored from Soledar and across the small towns that were right on the Lysychansk uh, Bakhmut Highway. It they looks set up a defense here. like a head. You see? Ah, uh, yes. People the actually nose, said that. <laughs> and then there's a chin, and this is like a, is. a bun. No, no, of the of the non-red area too. They both look like faces. See, it's ah, like you yeah, have a yeah, crow yeah, magnum right. forehead, and then you have a nose, <laughs> and then like a strong chin and like a bun, like a samurai. Sorry, I just wanted to point that out. No, of course th that is true. So <laughs> the Ukrainians set up a defense here across these towns, which still sort of holds, but with that avenue uh, blocked for the Russians, they decided to. Cal recalculate again. And they said, okay, what are we going to do? They decided to push through Tochovka and push through Vrubivka and Mikolaivka in hopes of cutting off some of the original Donbass defenses in Girska's Lotoe that were still holding. And we saw that developing 
because their hope was that they were going to cut off Girske's Lotoe and then move north to cut off Lysychansk. So this actually is sort of what happened. So we saw in between there's the Battle of Severodonetsk, which I want to talk a bit briefly about. So going to June 8th. Let's go to June 8th. So what happened in Severodonetsk? So if you followed the news during the Battle of Severodonetsk, uh, roughly what happened is that the uh, the Russians moved in sort of unopposed, uh, and people thought that, oh, the Ukrainians just started pulling back behind the river. Uh, but then there was a probably somebody countermanded that order, and the Ukrainians pushed all the way back into the town, hoping to you know push back the Russians. Now, there was a lot of buzz on social media about what actually happened. Some people said, that, oh, the, the Ukrainians threw the Russians completely out of the city. You know, Severodonetsk is ours. But I didn't really see the point in that because, you know, where are you going to go from Severodonetsk? What, really into where? There's, there's nowhere to go. So what really probably happened is that the Ukrainians really moved back in uh, and decided to hold positions at the Azot chemical plant while the Russians, you know, tried to force them out of it. There was a brief battle around Severodonetsk, and it actually was pretty vicious here. But this kind of became redundant as the operation around Girska Zlotoe played out. Why? Because when Girska Zlotoe fell, that's when the Ukrainians pulled out of, uh, of uh, Severodonetsk. There was a lot of fighting there, but where was it? Girska Zlotoe, 20th of June. So 10 some days later, uh, 12 days later, the Russians managed to break out of Tochevka here and run towards Mirna Talina and Mikolaevka and Vrubivka. And the Ukrainians figured out, okay, we're going to get encircled. So they moved out. And by the 22nd, the front line looked like this. Thankfully, there wasn't like Russian telegram and like either other misinformation media, they said that, oh, yeah, like we captured 2000 soldiers. There's barely photos for like 40 soldiers. So they only captured perhaps the rear guard. You're not telling but me they would lie. Oh, the Russians never. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about the information war, though, because it is uh, an interesting thing. Um, and I want to comment on it because uh, it is a, a war that has very aggressive meaning, uh, and sometimes it can give us, you know, unrealistic perspectives about what is actually going on. So, very briefly, what happened after this uh, is that the Rush, the the Ukrainians decided to pull out. They pulled out of Severodonetsk over the until the 25th. Basically, they were out of Severodonetsk. And then they hoped that perhaps we could, they could hold, you know, the area behind Lysychansk so that it isn't cut off. But really, the linchpin of the defense here was the uh, chemical plant, the Lys uh, not the chemical plant, the oil refinery. So this big here thing. So it's really interesting about industrial areas in this war. They have acted like fortresses slash. Uh, you know, castles. They 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 have become such an important you know aspect of the of the war. So the so basically the the oil refinery became important because that's where the roads that supplied Lysychansk converged. It was the Bakhmut Lysychansk Highway and the Siversk Lysychansk Road. So what happened is over the next ten days, the Russians pushed towards the refinery. Until they ended up taking Vovchoyarivka, and then eventually they ended up taking the refinery. Uh, one of these days, I think it was July second. No, well, that's too much. July first, and the Ukrainians at the same time decided, okay, they're at the refinery. We're gonna pull out, and they did. Uh, so that's where we're at right now. We've reached July in the Battle of Donbass. But in effect, what happened is. The Ukrainians kind of pulled out. People were saying that it was a very well-organized retreat, but eh, we have evidence that it was a bit 
chaotic. There were some videos of like people running, people in civilian cars, just kind of trying to uh, flee the the Russian encirclement uh, by going out through Bilohorivka. But even though it was chaotic, they only lost a little bit of equipment. They didn't lose a ton of soldiers in that operation. So the they successfully managed to make it out. And ever since the the Russians announced this operational pause, coincidentally when you know the HIMARS arrived. Uh, but for the last basically 10, 15 days, there hasn't been much going on. Uh, apart from that, the Russians are trying to encircle the Ugladarsk power station uh, by moving through Tolomitne and Lovo Novoluganska. So that's where a lot of the fighting is going on now to the south of Bakhmut. In these, in these areas where, the, where the, the fighting is most vicious right now, is there, if, if any territory is gained by Russia, is that a significant loss for Ukraine, or is this just a fighting for every inch of ground you can get type deal? Like, is there anything pivotal that Ukraine could lose here, apart from the general ebb and flow of territory over war? Any critical power plant or source of food? Anything like that, I mean. So, probably, the, that's the interesting thing, because, you know, if we go back to World War II, people think about, okay, where are the factories of the country? Where is the, you know, where's the population centers? What are the, what is the critical, you know, infrastructure that a country might capture in an offensive? But the reality is that dur during the opening month of the war, uh, Russia used a lot of its ballistic missiles to destroy a lot of the Ukrainian war industry and, and terror bomb, basically, a lot of the uh, country. They hit oil refineries, they hit rail yards, they hit ammo depots. They did a lot of damage. Uh, so the reality is that a lot of this, a lot of capturing in this area, that's the, the strategic aspect of it is, do you see this red line? Well, that's the original red... territory held before the war began properly. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. That is that is true. And along this red line, a formidable defense line existed. And it still exists, especially in this part of the line, which hasn't really moved that much. And the strategic aspect of this is, well, first it was the loss of Izium because that provided the bridgehead over the Seversky Donetsk, but that hasn't been exploited by the Russians, uh, uh, properly at least. We, we don't 100% know. They're probably stuck here in a defensive line. And then there was the loss of the Luhansk Oblast. Because when Lysychansk and Severodonetsk were the two large big towns left in Lugansk. So they lost the Lugansk Oblast, so Russia could actually announce a victory here. As to criticality for the war, I think that we shouldn't look at territory that much. Because in reality, the Ukrainian strategy, uh, it has to do with uh, the grand strategy, right? It has to do with them uh, slowly like moving back or, or going on small offensive. It's just like stalling the Russians as much as possible uh, while the Western weapons, you know, flow in and, and they're able to build up a military to kind of force them back. Because the reality of, of, it, of this is that the Ukrainians have lost a lot of equipment and they have another issue, which is ammunition, which I'm going to get to. Uh, fairly soon. Right. So the thing is, a, a lot of this operational success that the Russians have seen here comes down to their like thunderous superiority in artillery. They're firing back maybe six or seven times uh, the amount of of like shells that the Ukrainians are firing at them. Um, and that's why the technological edge of HIMARS is important. So what I think will happen here in the future for Donbass is that the battle will move to Slovyansk and Kramatorsk. Uh, Siversk and Bakhmut, um, while the Russians are stopped now, they, they aren't in a great position to defend themselves because they are, if you can see here in the height map, they're on the low ground. But behind that, there is a defensive line that the Ukrainians are likely to take up, which is the Chasov Yar um, Mikolaevka line, which is this line. This line here is on the high ground. So I expect the fighting basically to move to this line. And then the Russians are probably going to try to somehow get to Slovyansk and Kramatorsk. 
The thing is, if Slovyansk and Kramatorsk falls, it's going to be hard to defend the rest of Donetsk. The, that's the, the Donetsk Oblast uh, is basically here. So it's going to be, because Slovyansk and Kramatorsk are, are the big you know, fortress cities that are left in this area. So I think that's the goal for the Russians now. It's going to be a hard fight for Slovyansk and Kramatorsk, likely similar to Severodonetsk and Lysychansk, except that these two towns are more heavily defended. Um, yeah, so briefly, that's, that's what the Battle of Donbass is going to look like. Uh, the Ukrainians are also building up in the hopes of taking back Kherson. Uh, because if they manage to push the Russians behind uh, behind the uh, the river here, uh, the the Donetsk, sorry, not the Donetsk, uh, oh come on, the big river, the Dnieper. If they manage to push them behind the Dnieper, it means that the Russians won't be able to really strike towards uh, Mykolaiv and Odessa anymore, and the Ukrainians will be able to fortify this line and move a lot of reserves to a different part of the front, like the south, so that they could move towards Mariupol to, and towards Melitopol. How many, so, usable, how many usable bridges are down there at that point of the Dnieper? So there is uh, there is this bridge here. So this is the dam. This bridge, which got hit by HIMARS, we saw recently. And that's about it. There's also the railway bridge here. Uh, but in reality, uh, unless the Ukrainians are close, the Russians will keep repairing the bridges. It's actually really hard to destroy a bridge. Uh, there's a great video by, by a guy on, on, on YouTube. I don't remember his name now. But basically, he, he points out that destroying bridges is really hard. Sometimes you might end up taking down segments of a bridge. But taking down the whole bridge is difficult because it requires a lot of accuracy and it requires a lot of damage you know, from the bombs falling on the bridge. So and I assume you, efforts at blowing up the dam are not under consideration because dams are quite expensive and important. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, the Ukrainians have only ever tried to destroy one dam, which was the one, one, or, or actually maybe the Oskil Dam as well. But the dam that was here near, uh, where is it? Yes, Svitlodarsk. Uh, there was a dam here that the Ukrainians tried to blow up. But basically, they, they try to avoid destroying dams because, well, it's it's really hard to build a dam and you could cause a lot of, like, damage. You could cause a flood and yeah, that's, kill that's a, a lot big, of... Yeah, that's a big, big deal to blow up a dam. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah, that's yeah, that makes sense. Um, and it's hard to do with standoff weapons. It's not an easy thing to blow up a dam either. Le like, it's hard to blow up a bridge, let alone a dam. Well, dams are literally, like, 50 foot thick concrete you know um barricades yeah. it, ma it makes sense like it'd be pretty difficult for them to bring it down i um so i, I wanted to ask about the character of russian artillery so the, mm -hmm. fa the fact that russian artillery that's like their big thing you know as i understood yes. it it was because relative to precision missile strikes artillery is quite cheap it's indiscriminate russians tend not to care about civ civilian casualties um, mm -hmm. and it's also like, you can get good artillery that's not modern tech. Like, you, g artillery can be functional and effective, even if you're working off stuff that's basically, like, Cold War era in terms of its, um, its level of, of, of technological advancement, whereas the modern stuff that, say, the United States would use, like the HIMARS or whatever, like, ever it's gonna be like every missile is like a five million dollar, you know, um, a Pentagon expense. Uh, it, it gets a lot more complicated. So it it is largely because of technological um, availability and a lack of concern for civilian damage, right? With regards to the utility focus on Russia's part. Yes. Um, getting. I, I think I should get to strengths and weaknesses before I talk about uh, HIMARS, because I think I mentioned a lot about artillery here. Um, so what's the deal with Russian artillery, really? So it's the, the the Russians have a have a thing where they don't really throw stuff away, and <laughs> before yeah. Russia existed the Soviet Union, and back then the Soviet army was building up for a huge war with NATO that never really came. The Russian uh, sorry the the Soviet army had so much they had something like twelve thousand artillery pieces. Uh, in in uh, West in 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 uh, in Germany in Western Europe uh, in their like Western Front 
du during you know the Soviet times, and when when you know the Soviet Union fell apart, a lot of that equipment got spread out, but Russia kept a lot of it, and they kept building artillery. They they moved towards self-propelled artillery systems, and they are augmenting their accuracy with drones a lot of the time. But in general, yes, artillery. First of all, if you have a lot of it, you can do a lot of damage on on military targets and positions of the enemy. You can uh, you can keep uh, a if you have a lot of artillery, you can basically keep a line suppressed. You can you can even do uh, you know opportunity strikes, which is a lot of what the Americans and uh, and you know they what they're developing their artillery towards, being able to be super accurate and hitting targets that they know are there. Um, but the Russians use it as like a blanket. They destroy a lot of a lot of parts of the line. And the thing is, if you're sitting there, you can be you know the best, most motivated soldier in the world, right? It, there is to to an artillery shell. There is no difference between you and a special forces like uh, soldier. If you're sitting in a trench, you're just sitting in a trench. You're not fighting in a town where you know your tactical uh, ability actually matters a lot. So basically, yeah it's, the, yeah, it's cheating. Yeah, you're you're hitting from afar. It's it's cheating. And they also move towards the, the Russians. Also have a lot of rocket artillery, so they're firing into that. Uh, basically, what's the deal with Russia and their ammunition? You know, uh, we've seen HIMARS, right? And the the HIMARS came along, and a lot of uh, ammunition storages. We saw them go up in 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 flames, right? Um, it doesn't. It, it does this mean, however, that you know the Russians are going to run out of ammunition? Well, not really. It does it destroying ammunition depots, and um, a, a one ammunition depot does has a negligible amount of ammunition uh, in terms of like the grand uh, the grand strategy, the, the grand war. It, it may hold ammunition for two or three days, maybe five days of combats. So, what's the point of destroying uh, these? Um, these uh sorry before i get into that before the point of destroying the ammunition depots what's with russia and their ammunition availability so first of all they have the stockpiles of artillery shells that are left over from the soviet times which are eye-watering uh some people estimate that they've wasted between four to seven million shells in this operation uh and they are expected first of all they can produce cells because they're cheap and they have a lot of production capabilities there, and they won't be affected by sanctions. Uh, and not only that, they're expected to have either tens of millions or even some say in the hundreds of millions of shells. So we can't expect Russia to run out of ammunition. That unfortunately is just, it's not gonna happen. They have a lot, a lot of artillery shells, which is a problem because they can keep going. And HIMARS, Kind of solves the problem of um, of the overwhelming artillery um, of the Russians because it hits those uh, those uh, those uh, depots, which complicates Russian logistics. So it makes it it makes it that Russians have to take countermeasures. They need to move their logistics hubs further to the rear. They need to use more trucks. They need to use they need to they need to like take countermeasures. Try try to hit the missiles with air defense, which isn't easy, right? People say that the HIMARS is impossible to knock down. It really isn't impossible to knock down. But the problem is, if you mistake a HIMARS for just a, like a regular rocket from a grad, then you've kind of messed up because you've fired a multi, you know, a hundred thousand dollar round at a at a five hundred dollar round. You don't want to be doing that. Yeah, uh, it's I. Really um... I just I just did some um some quick googling here and mm -hmm. it looks like one of the most commonly used self-propelled artillery by Russia the 2S3 Akatsia um mm -hmm. the 152.4 mm shells that they fire look like th they're they're on resell for between 400 to 1200 so it's literally like a shot a shot from one of those is around between like one one hundredth and one one thousandth the cost of a HIMARS missile. So there's a significant difference in the Yes. Yeah. Whew. It's really it's really the Americans showing off exactly how much money they have, really. It's incredible. 
it like it is indescribable the amount of of money they have spent on their systems because a lot of people will either you know sacrifice uh, mass and and like accuracy sorry they will either sacrifice you know mass so they will have a lot a small amount of really accurate systems that are really high tech or they'll you know sacrifice accuracy and have like lots of weapons that are really cheap which is what the russians are doing they have some like high precision stuff but not nearly as many as the united states the americans have money for both and but they do both the himars <laughs> is performing well yeah i mean from all accounts yes. it seems like it's you know the 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 money is you know being the effects are being represented in in outcome to an extent with the with the precision oh, yes. of those strikes it does himars is doing exceptionally well the thing is uh, at the same time you know we should kind of temper our expectations the fact that you know the ukrainians are able to destroy uh, ammunition depots doesn't mean that you know the russians are going to collapse any day now uh it 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 does change a bit the dynamic of the war but there's too few systems uh to make like a very very big difference and also we need to keep in mind that you know russia has been able to hit ukrainian ammunition depots basically throughout the entire war we're basically giving good standoff weapons to the ukrainians is what you know the nato uh, camp is doing but in order to take back ground, they will have to give them, you know, armored personnel carriers and tanks and uh, proper trained, you know, uh, like they, they'll need to bring up, like create the logistical chains needed to, you know, push back the uh, Russians. And that's what I want to talk about now. What are the strengths and weaknesses of the two sides we are looking at, right? So the Ukrainians, they have very high morale because you know they're defending their land obviously they're going to have really high morale uh and they are fully mobilized which means that they have the 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 entirety of the manpower of ukraine is being made available to the government all of its industry even though it's decimated it'll you know keep producing as much as it can and of course there's the foreign support i can't stress enough how the, much how important the foreign support is if ukraine didn't have foreign support I think right about either now or maybe a few weeks ago, if or in a few weeks from now, they would be out of ammunition, artillery ammunition, that is, mm -hmm. which would have been really bad. They wouldn't have HIMARS. They wouldn't have uh, they, they they wouldn't have a lot of tanks and equipment that were given by the Western. So it is vital that that you know Western countries keep up their support for Ukraine because otherwise Ukraine will collapse. I know, you know, we're memeing about the Russians, you know, being completely uh, incompetent, and they are incompetent in a lot of ways, but they have a lot of stuff. If we're talking about a war of attrition, the Russians have an advantage, especially in terms of equipment. They have yeah, an they, insane amount of equipment. They spent the entirety of the Cold War when they were a superpower with a robust economy, stockpiling military equipment and ammunition. So even if yeah. they they still have a backlog from fifty years of 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 military buildup that is still you know perfectly functional today. Um, and and I mean clearly yeah. right, like a lot a ton of the equipment they're deploying is like Cold War equipment. Um, yes. So yeah, some of it is modernized, but basically yeah, the Ukrainians have been complaining on the front lines, especially you know the territorial defense brigades. They have. They have had pretty bad morale, and I understand it because you know they're sitting there taking pretty big casualties, and a lot of the time they don't even see a Russian soldier for it. They're just getting shelled by artillery, sitting in their trenches, and suffering pretty bad casualties. Um, so, yeah, very briefly, what what did I want to? Yeah, of course, the problems that Ukraine is suffering from. First of all, there's the ammunition shortage. Ukraine had a lot of similar systems to Russia. So a lot of their artillery, pretty much the majority, the vast majority of their artillery before the war was chambered for 152 millimeter rounds and 122 millimeter rounds. What does that mean? It means that if you don't have the industry behind you, you will have to rely on your stockpiles of, of ammunition. Now, the, the Russians hit the industry and they hit the stockpiles. So the Ukrainians ended up having this problem of having a really big artillery arm, you know, of hundreds of guns, which is really significant. Keep in mind, that's a, more than a lot of NATO countries. They had a really big, you know, 
stockpile of, of, of uh, guns, but they didn't have the shells to shoot with. Now, the West responded fairly quickly. They sent, you know, stockpiles from former Warsaw Pact countries like Poland, like Bulgaria, uh, Romania. They tried to sh send as much stuff as they could, but that's a finite amount of shells. And let's be fair, the Bulgarian military industry won't be able to produce enough shells to keep the uh, Ukrainian guns going. So that means that Ukraine needs to replace hundreds of self-propelled and towed guns that are chambered in 152 millimeter to move to the NATO standard, which is 155 millimeter. And that's an aspect of the war where I think that the Westerners are falling behind in. They haven't sent enough towed artillery and they haven't sent enough self-propelled artillery. They should send more because right now they have sent maybe two, 300 guns worth of stuff, but the Ukrainians need to replace 700 to 1,000 guns. So that is a really important aspect of the war that the, you know, the, that the Westerners have actually kind of, you know, slacked on and they need to get going. And they also need to send, you know, heavy, heavy weapons. Now, I've put here that Ukraine has a devastated economy, and that is true. Uh, the their economy is projected to retract by something like sixty percent this year, which is you know terrible. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, the Western money is infinite, so they they're just gonna keep giving them money to keep their economy going. So that isn't that big a problem as long as the Westerners keep up the supply of money. Now the heavy weapons shortage is also a problem that they'll need to fix. The thing is maybe something like 200 to 300 tanks have been sent to Ukraine. They need to send a few more tanks. They need to send armored personnel carriers. They need to send, uh, they need to send a lot of stuff and, and artillery, of course. And the thing is, it's probably only the Americans that can supply this stuff. Because apart from the Americans, if we're looking at other NATO armies, like France, Germany, um, like Italy, those countries, <laughs> they have so few tanks, so little ammunition, so few armored personnel carriers. It is embarrassing. Yeah, right? you know, I've, I've, I've really quickly on a brief tangent. I've thought about this. Mm -hmm. Right. One of the things that um, the Soviet Union was able to do really effectively was get like its weapons all over the world with allied countries because they, yeah. you know, the shit they produced was never really as advanced as ours, at least not at most points in the world. There were times where they jumped ahead of us, but for the most part, like, we've maintained a superior edge in technological production. But the thing is now, like, all the modern vehicles that we produce are so advanced and so expensive that we can't really, like, we can't really be the arsenal for democracy because this shit requires, like, a gigantic training manual and seven years of practice to be able to use. I feel like it might, I feel like it might be a good long-term strategy for like you know we have a bunch of m1 abrams you know in the u.s and we have a bunch of sick ass self-propelled artillery and rocket salvos and all that but wouldn't it be a good idea for us to just keep in the backlog a bunch of shit that's a lot less complicated we can just keep it in a giant depot somewhere and it's like yeah we have eighteen thousand fucking self-propelled artillery cars they are all operating on 1980s tech and they take like five days to learn how to use you want some yeah here you go like for yeah, relatively actually... cheap that is actually a really good idea and a great point. You know, we saw in Afghanistan how, how you know, all that great tech, you know, uh, that, 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 uh, that America had given to the Afghan government and they figured out that they couldn't service it. And when they pulled out, they said, OK, don't worry, we're going to service the helicopters over Zoom. Like, come on, guys, it's not going to happen. You know, it's not going to happen. I just feel and... like we should have two. We have to we have to have two like armored vehicle tracks, right? We need to have the really sick shit that we use. And then we need to have and, a yeah, fuck ton of the like, yeah, the <laughs> discount. Yeah, the discount stuff. And maybe like yeah. the world ends and that then that becomes like the standard. Or if we want to help other countries out, we can be like, yeah, you know, we yeah, we do have 18 trillion like you know, tanks that probably wouldn't go up against an M1 Abrams, but would definitely go up against anything less than that. Yeah, go for it, you know? Yeah. I don't know, yeah. So, yeah, somebody actually in chat did say, hey, maybe we should send them Abrams. Now, there's there's something that you need to consider about sending Abrams to Ukraine and why it is a bad idea. Can you guess? Well, I can, I can guess. I can't answer for them, though. Okay, so I'll answer the question... So yeah, some people say logistics. Yes, logistics is a big part of it. 
So one part is logistics. The Ukrainians won't be able to actually maintain and, and repair them very easily, and they'll have to move them back and forth to Poland to do that. Then there's the fuel consumption that is massive. And then there's the other problem. Uh, the Abrams is kind of fat. It's kind of fat and heavy, okay? It weighs, what, 75 tons? Uh, you have to cross over bridges in Eastern Europe. You don't want to be doing that in an Abrams. You want to be doing that in America a Mobile tank. coming through. Yeah. Goddamn Walmart mobility scooter uh, yeah. on, on its way across <laughs> these European bridges. Which is, which is also part of the issue why people were talking about sending Leopard 1 tanks if Germany wasn't being, you know, kind of shitty. Uh, sending Leopard 1 tanks instead of sending Leopard, uh, Leopard 2A4s and Leopard 2A7s because those are much heavier. M1 Abrams now, are the, huge. Jesus, yeah, yeah, they're yeah, so yeah, yeah. big. Oh my God, the, 60 short tons? Four, 50, 40, what the fuck? They're so big. Sorry. Yeah, part of the problem is that the American... Uh, like all previous generation tanks, they're actually not that great, uh, and they're pretty heavy too. The the M sixties, uh, they 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 was kind of an area where the Soviets had the Americans beat before the Abrams came around. So the the M sixties aren't ideal. Now, when it comes to you know Western equipment, what are other countries that could provide a lot of equipment? Now in NATO. The other big players are like countries like Turkey, for example, which is, you know, Turkey is getting ready to invade Rojava again. So, mm -hmm. you know, and Turkey is a ki kind of an unreliable ally in that terms. And then, you know, funnily enough, Greece. Do you know how much equipment Greece has? Greece has seven times more tanks than, than Britain has. We preparing, have more armored personnel carriers. Preparing more for artillery. war with uh, Turkey, no doubt, to yes. settle the great score. Our NATO ally, we are we, we, the reason why Greece can't send its in, its ridiculous stockpile of Cold War weaponry to Ukraine. We've sent some. We've sent some Kalashnikovs. We've, we're sending some BMPs. But the reason why we can't leverage that is because we're worried about our NATO ally in Turkey. Because we're worried that they're going to try to snatch a bunch of islands off of us. And, you know, funnily enough, I might end up in a front line if that happens. So I don't even want to think about it, you know? Uh, thankfully, I haven't gone to the army yet. Yeah, so briefly be... <laughs> explain to chat why Turkey and Greece have ancient blood debts with each other. Because Americans don't, like, we don't know this by default, you know? Oh, why, why there's ancient blood debts? But, uh, well, uh, it, is, it is a bit complicated, but... I'd start at the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the the slow collapse of the Ottoman Empire, where Greece had its revolution, you know, in it in the 1820s, and then as time went on, Greece grew. Then big growth for Greece, the Balkan Wars before World War One, uh, where Greece, uh, Bulgaria, and Serbia like ganged up together to take down the take to kick the uh the turks uh, the the ottomans out of uh out of the macedonia and like uh and and thessaly and these parts of of greece so if we go to a map oh they, they kicked the ottomans out then there was a brief fight between the former allies uh and bulgaria in the second balkan wars but the last big war between Greece and Turkey actually happened in 1920, 1919 to 1922. That was when the Ottoman Empire was collapsing and Greece invaded Turkey and made it almost all the way to Ankara. But then the Brits decided to kind of pull out and then the French kind of pulled out and then the Turks having, you know, successfully revolted the, the, the new Turks, the the young Turks, basically the 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 Turkish Revolution. I know these them. guys pushed, yeah, pushed Greece all the way back, and in the end, the there was the burning of Smyrna, which is now Izmir. Uh, basically, uh, both sides did colossal war crimes during that war. Like it, it is insane. And after that, there was an exchange of populations, where almost a million and a half Greeks left Anatolia, and some like seven to eight hundred thousand Turks left Greece. So it was. Really, really, really bad. And I'm glad I asked this because I actually had no fucking idea about that last part. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. it was really terrible. 
in the Greek the Greek population at the time was like what five six million, and suddenly like another twenty percent of the country showed up. You know, the long-standing uh, battle to over which country has the best Mediterranean food. Yeah, when people you know when people talk about uh, you, have you seen those uh, what are they called the decolonial uh, like tanky adjacent leftists that sometimes they talk about population moving a population out doing ethnic yeah like, yeah yeah like uh, population displacement. Yeah, you should look into the the population exchange between Turkey and and Greece and the genocides that that took place during that time. It, it, not a good not a good one. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, basically, last beef was in Cyprus in uh, in the nineteen seventies because Greece was ruled by a military dictatorship that uh, looked to unite with Cyprus. The hardliners took over in a counter coup after the uh, the university revolt that I remember we talked about last year, and they try they propped up a Greek uh, a, like a Greek coup in the island, and then Turkey invaded the island to protect the uh, the settlement between Britain, Turkey, and Greece. But then they never kind of they kind of never left. So there's a cold war in in Cyprus. It is divided along the Turkish part and the Greek part. And the food there and is very a... good, as I hear. Oh, yeah. The, the, the food is good everywhere. All of this area has excellent food. Oh, no, I know. I'm fully... No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, of course. I'm just saying that the, the, heat, of, the heat of battle produces the tastiest, uh, you know, tzatziki sauce uh, in, in, yeah. in all the Mediterranean, right there in Cyprus. But yeah, basically now the conflict is over, you know, like water zones and who controls, you know, uh, rights to these areas, especially because there's a lot of natural gas here. And Greece is having a cheat, which is having a lot of islands, which are really close to Turkey. And especially this one. Do you see this? Uh, now this I is do. Greek. This is a Greek island and it's right there. And... If there was ever a war between uh, Turkey and Greece, that island is going to go. What if we just it's merged kind of you guys? Do you think you could just be like Grizerki or like Teak or something and like sort of settle it? <laughs> that'd be that'd be that'd be really interesting, you know. Uh, I, I'm I'm all you know. Get rid of the borders. It's just that I, I know how the Greeks would react and how the Turks would react. I mean, the Turks would be more happy to do that, especially because there's like 80 million of them. You know, there's a lot yeah, more Turks. Yeah. You can do the Ottoman Empire uh, too, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, I don't want to distract you for too long because I only have till yeah. a half hour um, after the oh, hour. Okay, okay, perfect. I wanted to talk about um, a, a bit about the information war aspect of this. Um, did I, do oh, I have a slide? For I have some information for you really quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have, I have one. Yes, I, I, I have to use the restroom. Talk to my chat. I'll be right back. Oh, of course. Go ahead. Hi, chat. I am now in charge. It is excellent to have command of such a wonderful audience. How are you guys doing? All I need to know is, am I good looking? You know, do I have the Greek angles? You know, am I like a statue? <laughs> All right. Let's talk a bit about the information war, shall we? Yes, soon enough, I'll have my own uh, Twitch uh, that is going to run with so many people. It's going to be great. All right. Okay, everybody. So, uh, oh, by the way, if you want to quickly, there you go. That's where you follow me. All right. That's where you, that's, that's what you should be looking at. That, that, that's me. I'm the guest. Okay. Right. So information war. So there is an aspect of this war that, that goes a bit, you know, uh, under uh, discussed, underreported. And it is the All right, fact. I'm back. Yes, am I attractive? Come on. They Come say on. yes. Yes. Wonderful. All right, perfect. <laughs> one of them said, say the N-word. Oh, Christ. Uh, which one? Uh, nice. Nice. Perfect. That's well the one I'm going to be saying. I'm not saying the other one. All right. <laughs> so I wanted to briefly go into the information war. Uh, first of all, uh, 
the Russians uh, lie all the time, but they lie incompetently uh, in a lot of cases. They, they especially like uh, Russian propagandists online will often announce the fall of something way before it has fallen or has come into, because they, they, they take up, you know, press releases from the LPR and DPR, like the separatists, and they just blurt them out into the public. Uh, and, you know, often, and they'll do a lot of, you know, anti-vax, weird conspiracies, Ukraine will collapse in a few days, it's all BS, and especially their tracking of losses is way out of hand. It is, they, 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 they have, according to them, they've destroyed like 150% of the Ukrainian Air Force already, and and, you, and 200% of their drones. Did, did you see the, where right after the HIMARS were deployed, they showed that grainy, like, 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 uh, yeah. like Arby's back alley video cam footage of some flash of light, and they were like, "Yeah, that was us destroying two Himars. Trust us." Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. I saw, I saw, I saw like Russian uh, true believers, like people, people in the comments saying, "Why does the Minister of Defense do that thing? Why do they put so grainy footage? I know they can do better." <laughs> it's it's really like funny. so bad. Like they could fake it better. <laughs> Um, yes. it, they <laughs> don't. It's like they're. It's like they're. They're testing you. They're like, all right, what can we get away with? We're gonna. We're gonna show. We're gonna show a video of someone with a sparkler on an American Fourth of July evening, and we're gonna say this is actually like Kiev being destroyed. Let's, let's go. God, sorry. Okay, sorry, sorry. Getting distracted again. Uh oh. Hello. Oh no, he's dead. Well, oh, rip. It's all over. I'm trying to see if I can find the video footage that they purported. Okay, this is from a pro-Russia simp channel. I think. Oh, Hindustan Times? Okay, this is like an India... Yeah, because they side with Russia, basically. This is it! This is the video footage! Look! So this, so this is then claiming to take out, like, these two incredibly advanced American-guided missile... Deployers, and they're like, "Yeah, dude, we got him. Got him. That's it. They're gonna play it again. Got him. There. That was that was two of them. It doesn't even hit. It you. The the things they're targeting are the little white things. That, this looks like a missed drone strike. But they were like, "Yeah, that. Yeah, that that there was a Himars down there. Like this is real. This is this was put out by the Russian press." See, look! They're like, yes, gl glorious Russian victory against decadent American Himalus rocket system confirmed. And it's like... Again! Russian military said high-precision air-launched missiles destroy two U.S. Himalus... Please give me English comments. I'm skeptical about the footage, how peace prevails soon. The comedian in Ukraine versus the professional general in Russia. No contest. Sweet music to the ear. Keep up the good work, great Russia. Zelensky must be tried for forcing a war on Ukrainian people and still remains unaccountable. When Putin comes under the sun, the sun receives vitamin protein. Emoji with sunglasses. Nice meme. Well, Richard's fucking dead. Richard! Oh, Christ! Hello. Yeah, I, I'm sweating bullets right now. You don't understand. You made it. <laughs> you cannot m conceptualize. I was about to throw my router out of the window, actually grab it from the cables and then swing it over my head and, and, and throw it as far as it could go. But no, it, it works and it, uh, they didn't get me. <laughs> it's, those, it's those fucking Ottomans. They're, um, they're, they're fiddling even now with your wires. Oh, Christ. Yeah, I, it, I don't know. It was Discord. My, my internet was fine. 
uh, I could I could still see the stream, you know. It, I I don't know why. It's happened. it could have just been Discord. The servers they run the calls through sometimes get kind of finicky. It, it, it can be a million things. Yeah. Oh Christ. Okay. Uh, let me stop uh, sweating now. Uh, turn on my camera. Yes. Yes. I'm back. Okay. Perfect. Jesus. All right. Information war. Uh, very briefly. Uh, yeah. I think I, I, what I wanted to talk about as well, you know, as <laughs> as well as the. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Russian misinformation is the fact that uh, it is morally okay and understandable for the Ukrainians to engage in misinformation. However, they do it. I, I, people should know that the Ukrainians do engage in some sort of memeing, uh, in actually quite aggressive memeing, that does put out certain, you know, a certain wrong idea about the war and what's happening and it is understandable you know and you know they'll report things that are wrong however we need to be able to read between the lines and you know factor this into our analysis it is i cannot overstate just how different the type of lying that you know ukrainians and russians do is the ukraine the russians are in the moon they're somewhere way off but the Ukrainians kind of exaggerate uh, certain aspects of the war, certain successes. They downplay certain uh, failures. I think, and they will also uh, fudge with the numbers I in think terms the, of losses. The critical difference: you can't expect a government in a war like this, like a total war, to be fully honest. Not. Because if they did, they'd be giving away information. Like you, you there is going to yeah. be a level of obfuscation. I think the difference is that Russia is willing to lie for about to, in ways that are meant to justify their involvement in the conflict and ukraine's lies are strategic and tactical about the actual logistics of carrying out the conflict so i don't really care if russia lies about how many tanks they've lost like that seems like a normal thing to lie about but when they lie by creating like false flags in their own territory like that's a kind that, that that's a different it's like a moral lie like you're you're lying you're you're lying not as a a, a a a tactical necessity to win the war effort, but as a as a as a a, a sort of propagandistic necessity to convince people that the war was necessary to begin with, right? Like that. Like I think those are two very different types of lying in wartime. Of course, of course. And the thing is, uh, I I want to go uh, briefly over. Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course. You, you have we've yet to see a Ministry of Defense that won't fudge numbers during a war. However, what Russia does is indescribably like uh, horrible. Uh, what I what I wanted to talk about is a few, you know, really popular ones uh, that popular myths that are floating around, which I, I'd rather see dispelled because I want uh, our message to be focused. I want people to understand that Ukraine, in order to be able to stay in this fight, uh, it needs to be able to uh, output. Uh, they need to be able to receive Western aid because a lot of like information on twitter and on other platforms will have you believe that this war is a walk in the park you know oh, the russians they can't do anything they're all you know drunk stumbling around they can't hit anything with their artillery apart from hospitals and uh, and uh, children's uh, kindergartens right orphan uh, they... orphanage seeking yeah. uh, artillery shells of course like it, it, you you'll get that idea if you only listen to those kinds of sources that the russians are you know completely incapable of doing anything and that's not really true they do a lot of damage so they need the the ukrainians need western aid i want to talk a, briefly about losses the uh, the ukrainians in their ministry of defense uh like uh, announcements they say that the russians have lost between 38 and 40,000 killed in action that is a bit hard to believe and the reason why that is hard to believe uh is because you need to uh, multiply every death by around two or three, maybe four, uh, to figure out what the casualties are. Because for every dead soldier, there's going to be one missing, there's going to be one wounded, there's going to be one, uh, like, uh, there's, there's going to be people that desert. You're going to lose people. So casualties and deaths are not the same thing. So if Russia had indeed lost around 40,000 soldiers, that would mean that you would have to add another 
maybe 80 to 120,000 on top of that as casualties, which would be, you know, almost their entire invasion force. While I can, I can much better believe that their casualties are closer to 60 to 80,000 than 120 to 160,000. That's too much. Mm -hmm. And reliable OSINTERs and Western analysts actually place the number of Russian deaths closer to 18 to 25,000. So I wanted that to, uh, to just uh, to clarify that. Yeah, and, it's 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 yeah. a pretty fucking significant number, right? And um, yeah. es estimations Huge. on on tank losses that are that have been like I don't know, like destroyed or scuttled or whatever um, is is what in excess of fifteen hundred on Russia's end. They were supposed to have something like ten to twelve thousand tanks at the war's beginning, and not all of those are going to be functional either. So they might um, like you know maybe they have infinite ammunition, but. They at this rate, it seems like they might actually eventually run out of some types of armored equipment. So here's uh, about tanks specifically. We sixteen hundred is a bit of an exaggeration. I yeah, the Russians probably. probably have lost somewhere between seven hundred to nine hundred tanks, which is a lot. But the Russians don't have twelve thousand tanks. That's way too much. The Russians probably have around six or seven thousand tanks. Maybe a bit, a few, maybe a little bit less. If they are, you know, if we consider that that you know a lot of them won't be serviceable. Uh, however, uh, something that we need to consider is that a lot of their tank losses occurred in the early part of the war, where there was this chaotic fighting and they would move past, you know, ambush teams. Nowadays, unfortunately, the number of Russian tanks lost day to day has dropped off significantly. So. Uh, we can't really accept, expect the Russians to run out of tanks just yet. Now, something that we God can them expect day. them. Yeah, something that we can expect them, though, is one of their big weaknesses that I said in this slide. So it didn't go over this, but Russia has overwhelming firepower uh, and it has a steady ammo supply and mobilization potential. What do I mean by that? Russia is still fighting with its peacetime military, augmented by militias from Donbass, uh, PMCs like the Wagner uh, neo-Nazi type deal, uh, and also volunteers from Ru all over Russia. The thing is, Russia is not mobilized. It doesn't consider itself to be at war. So that means that they haven't really mobilized their war industry as much and they haven't called up their conscripts. The Ukrainians have called up all of their conscripts. They're basically going full ham right now. The problem is that it's, of course, it's a really difficult political decision, you know, calling up conscripts. Mm -hmm. And right now, however, the Russians are really struggling for manpower. That's why they're, you know, we, we see all those 50 year olds, uh, you know, in uniform getting ready to go into Ukraine. It's not because the Russians don't have any, they, they, lost everything you know it's because they're they aren't mobilizing they're not calling up their one to two million reservists if russia mobilizes we can expect the russians to outnumber the ukrainians in the front um so that's something that russia is really struggling for manpower and my guess is that they're hoping they can take the donbass as they are right now and then later um, you know, and then later mobilize if they if they can't achieve uh, some sort of uh, peace there to try to you know push further into Ukraine. Well, the, but the hope, yeah. I mean, the hope would be even if Russia has like functionally a limitless supply of of manpower, if they're willing to call on them, would be that there's no way they could ever maintain the supply lines for that many troops moving forward. That it would turn into yeah, like an elbow bumping also clusterfuck. Of course, yeah. Uh, the logistics of of uh, deploying a million men is actually quite really uh, difficult. Hard. Yeah, it's it's also part of why uh, the Ukrainians have those million men they have in their army, kind of spread out throughout Ukraine, and not all of them on the front line. In parts of the front line, the Russians still outnumber the Ukrainians. Now, if if Russia was to mobilize, more fronts would open. There would be a renewed offensive on Kharkiv. There would be a renewed offensive in in uh, in Shumi and Chern and uh, so basically the 
the Russians would likely move in again, trying to take Kharkiv. They would try to move in on Sumy. They might try to move in again in this direction. But I don't think they would go through Belarus again because they dug up Chernobyl so much. It's basically like radioactive death zone now. <laughs> like it, it is, it is not pretty. What what is with the radiation around Chernobyl right now? So yeah. they would they would likely move in back in again, um, and they would probably equip those soldiers with a lot of their you know Cold War equipment. They would pull out uh, of Surge, you know, because the Ukrainian lack of heavy weapons also affects the capability of their troops of their new troops to go on the offensive because you need those heavy weapons to go on the offensive uh and you know if you pull uh, if you if you pull up you know 700 600,000 men of light infantry you can't necessarily put them all on the front line they won't there won't be a big difference. You have diminishing returns as to what you can do with light infantry. Hence why they're spread out. Hence why a lot of them are training or on, you know, weapon systems. So they can eventually deploy and go on the offensive. Yeah, getting getting uh, like all the resources that far out means that you need to have supply lines that are like within fucking Himars range. Um, it's like you, you, yes. you need to have room for everyone to sleep. Um, more men can be lost by like a lucky missile or artillery strike on the other side like yeah pa past the point it, it, there's not really a benefit to more guys being out there the thing the, the real million dollar question for me you know if this drags on long enough how long do you think it'll take before russia starts dusting off their t-34s and bringing out mm -hmm. the the goddamn world war ii weaponry for like uh you know the, the last ditch effort when will it happen so so okay, so there's uh, there's this uh, th this war analyst uh, who's also a YouTuber called Perun, and he did a video on on Russian equipment, uh, and he said that you, we might not see T-34s because they don't have almost any left; they only have them as parade tanks. Uh, we might end up seeing though maybe T-55s, although that is a doubtful. What you're more likely to see if this goes on forever is uh, Katyushas from World War II, because they have some of those in reserve, actually a decent number of them. They have a decent number of World War II artillery pieces in, in reserve. Most of their stuff is Cold War, though. What I wanted to, but getting to your point is when will, you know, Russia uh, completely collapse? It's hard to say. These things, uh, I just want, I, I'm sorry, I just want to say these things would, I'm pretty sure these things would fall apart if you threw a rock at them. The armor plating on World War II armored equipment wouldn't even, like, you could literally, like, medium arms fire these things to death, right? I don't even know if you would need explosives to, to destroy some of these vehicles. I'm ready. Yeah, yeah. I'm ready for the goddamn Katusha rocket launchers marching towards Kiev. I'm ready. Sorry. Even the, even the T-34s, you know, which are tanks, uh, modern, uh, like, 20 millimeter autocannons would probably rip them to shreds. Oh, God, uh, that'd be so good. Can you imagine watching the fucking World Star videos? Holy shit, dude. Oh, you could, yeah, you could, yeah, you could have fucking U Ukrainian soldiers with autocannons or, like, grenade launchers or something literally just ripping apart these World War II attacks. It'd be like a fucking... It, it, it'd be like the shit that happens in video games when the pe yeah. people from the future come back or whatever. Like those old yeah, history yeah, games, yeah. but in reality, holy fuck, that'd be good. Sorry, okay, yeah, sorry, I'm done, I'm done. At the same time, it would be pretty bad if we saw a video of a T-34 actually getting a kill, you know, that'd be... Ugh, there, that'd be... There's been T yeah, <laughs> there's been T-34s in modern conflicts as well. We've seen them, I think, in Afghanistan, we've seen them in... Uh... Uh, we've seen them, I think, in Syria, there was probably a few examples. Yemen, yeah, Yemen. That'd be bad uh, for morale. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, but getting to your point, when will Russia collapse? Basically, Russia is getting into this mentality of a long war, being able to sustain their operations for a long time. I wouldn't expect them to be to collapse until like mid to late 2023, in my opinion. However, people will disagree with me on this. I want to stress, I don't know. <laughs> and most people are just doing educated guesswork as to when the Russians will collapse. And some people have done that, you know, more educated than I am, have made some pretty terrible predictions. You know, they have said, OK, yeah, uh, by by the end of April, the Russians are going to be out of out of like uh, out of Odessa, out of Crimea. Yeah, it just 
slow down okay like we need to we need to take this slower and understand that it's it's not very easy to actually predict these things but they they would have to mobilize because i will say this as a certainty no matter how much they're able to push they need to occupy the territory they push they need to control the terrain they need to have occupation troops they need to they need to be able to control this territory which means that they're stretching their manpower thinner and thinner as they're occupying more uh more land even though the front line is nominally getting smaller they can only sustain that up to a point eventually i think they can get to the edges of Donetsk if they manage to, you know, dislodge the Ukrainians from Slovyansk and Kramatorsk. But in the end, they will have to mobilize if they are to really threaten Ukrainian statehood, you know? So seeing an end to this, I'd say, is pretty quick, which is, you know, funny because I I spoke to Xander Hall, I think in the fifth or sixth day of the war, I was mm -hmm. in his chat and he was watching a live stream of Kyiv and I said, hey, do you like to, you know, uh, hop on to talk about this? Uh, would you like me to hop on? And he was like, oh, yeah, sure. And I spoke to him for about an hour. Uh, and at some point I told him, you know, let's not be hasty about this. This war could last for for weeks, months, if not years. And he said, you know, you, you think this could go on for years? And I said, well, I don't know. But I said that nobody really knows. But back then I had the idea that this might drag on and we might see tens of thousands of people dying. Uh, a lot of people in the early parts of the war, they also said that, uh, oh, the Russians, you know, they don't have artillery. It was all, you know, corruption. It was all eaten away because they were doing this weird Zerg rush thing. And then I said, well, I think that when they bog down, they'll start using their artillery more. And that did come out true, you know? Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, oh, it's generally yeah. a good form, I think, to moderate your uh expectations uh when it comes to stuff yes. like this i would i would totally agree with that uh take um yeah oh last thing in the information war section which i wanted to talk about have you seen those videos of uh russian soldiers on trucks uh that are civilian and yeah. on vehicles that are civilian yeah the and the chucky e. cheese party mobiles with yeah. the top carved off with the z painted on the side yeah this this is a personal pet peeve of mine because people saw that that um, video and they they concluded, oh, the Russians are out of trucks. And I said, no, that's not what that means. And upon a little further inspection, those Chuck E. Cheese Batmobile, like uh, Scooby-Doo vehicles, they were mostly the separatists using them. The yeah. separatists and the Rosgvardia, the National Guard, units the russian army has trucks and and they the russia has also a trucking industry so they can make trucks uh what you should have taken out as a you know as an example is how little they care about the lives of the separatists they don't give them equi the equipment they need they give them garbage and they throw them into the line as artificial spotting they move them forward in an attack that they know will fail and the, once they figure out when, where the Ukrainian positions are, they're going to start shelling them because they don't want to kill, you know, a lot of people from, you know, mainland Russia, Moscow. They want to kill, you know, they want to if they, they want their losses heavily offset on the separatists and on the and on, you know, more ethnic units from uh, from, you know, Chechnya here in or yeah, Chechnya, Buryatia, uh, the uh, Tatarstan, th those places. Yeah, so and... you have a you have a bunch of guys rolling in there in like, op like open top pickup trucks with Mosins, um, yeah. who are acting as cannon fodder for the real Russian army. And then when they die, the Russian army's like, "Wow, look at the indiscriminate slaughter the Ukrainian people are conducting in the Donbass region. Look at all these honest, earnest, hardworking people in the Donbass who the Ukrainians are slaughtering." Um, yeah, I've seen yeah. A, I've seen a lot of like odd odd like uh odd things come out and i would urge people to um be really prudent about the information they consume online uh especially you know videos of the war uh a video of like a certain tank being destroyed or something like it's a really small scale it can't really give you a good idea 
of what is actually happening on the grander scale of the war. So it might actually warp your individual perception of what you know goes on in this conflict. So I would highly recommend that uh, you know you take a step back, you look at the grand scale of things, and you follow some you know more serious analysts. Uh, when it comes to information, because there's going to be a lot of information war, and it is expected, you know, like we we can't have people be disappointed when the Ukrainian troops didn't march into Crimea in April. Like, slow down. It's going to be a long war. Uh, settle down. Uh, before we end, because it's it's coming. It's about time that that you you're running out now. Um, I wanted to mention some another personal pet peeve of mine. Uh, tech nerds and the land for time uh, people. Uh, so tech nerds, uh, these guys will talk about a lot about how every single weapon system that uh, the Westerners send to Ukraine will change the war. This is probably more true, if anything, for HIMARS, but it hasn't been true for every system in in the world so don't take tech nerds saying that oh this is this is it's over it's it's basically over we send this like 10 12 guns it's gonna be it's gonna be over don't take the, those guys seriously you can you know it's fascination at the at the weapon systems themselves is nice but wars are won by patience logistics and perseverance like uh, and heavy weapons uh that's how you move front lines it's not by having the fanciest weapon system, is being able to support them, having enough of them, a lot of stuff. Uh, another thing, land for time. A lot of people, when Ukraine retreats from an area, they say that, oh, don't worry, that place is a ruin now, and there's no point in defending it anymore. And, you know, we're trading land for time. Okay, so that's true. On a grander scale, Ukraine is trading land for time. But if we're looking at an operation, say here, and we go on the 1st of July, the fact that the Ukrainians are pulling out of here doesn't mean that they're doing so willingly. And because, you know, it's a tactical, uh, like, 12D chess move. Sometimes you just can't hold onto the territory you need. And the way you judge whether or not loss of territory is important or unimportant is by looking at what has been lost. So if we go back here, if we see that the Russians are moving back and forth in this area, there isn't much here. So there's no worries. But here, there's a highway. Here, there is a, the, here's, there's a rail line and the highways converge. So look at what's actually being lost and won. Look at what is there for the Russians to take and what could be their objective in the area. Not all uh, terrain is made equal. And... A very similar uh, thing to this would be in Kharkiv, unfortunately, because the big redeeming quality of the Kharkiv offensive wasn't that the Ukrainians took all of this territory. It was the fact that they had this bridgehead here over the, over in Stari Salto, but they pulled out of there. So in my opinion, the Kharkiv offensive was flashy, but it, it kind of missed the point a little bit because the Ukrainians got, moved out of a lot of their defensive positions in Kharkiv. So when terrain moves, you should be looking at what is won and what is lost, not just that it moves and that it hasn't moved that much on a grand scale. That's my final point. I don't think I have anything else. And yeah, foreign support, it's important. I think I've, I've stressed that Is point. it? <laughs> yeah, it is very important. And the Westerners should need to get off their ass and uh and Jer turkey and greece need to solve their beef and be able to send the insane amount the unjustifiable amount of weapons they have there is absolutely no reason why greece should have 1400 tanks okay armored warfare in greece is like trying to sword fight in a closet why does Greece have so many tanks? We have no valleys. It's almost all of it is mountains. What, how, where are you going to use that many tanks? There's no front line. There's just, we have tanks sitting on our islands. We have tanks in Chios. It is, it is unbelievable. <laughs> okay. There's no, no point in that. Uh, that's, yeah.
Okay, I'm, enough. Microsoft no, I'm stuff. I'm I'm telling you, okay? This is uh, America needs to rebuild um the arsenal of democracy. An M1 Abrams tank today um costs around 10 million dollars to make, okay? Meanwhile, an M60 tank. Oh, did that... we lose contact again? I, uh, I can't no. hear you. Hello? Oh no. Hello? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh-oh, it's happening. Hello? Hello, hello? Uh-oh. Uh oh. Well, we can. I'm still gone hear again. Him. Well, God we can... damn it. Do you think if he thinks we can't see him, he'll get like naked? Like, do you think he's like, oh, well, they can't see me. Doesn't matter if my dick's out. Now, now I'm kind of worried. What? Yeah. What if he types the N word? <laughs> we can oh, hear you. Oh, I can hear you now. Wait, hello? Yes. Yes, I can. Okay. So to finish <laughs> to finish my excellent idea, okay? Right? Oh, the yeah, M1 go ahead. M1 Abrams, all right? Costly, 10 million dollars. A lot of upkeep, logistics, blah blah, okay? M60 would cost like 3 million. Just build 50,000 of those, put them in a giant hole in the ground, okay? And then whenever our America allies has a lot of them. They should they should send a lot of them. We need more. Okay, we need a fuck. We need like an infinite number. And anytime anything happens anywhere, they only cost half a million in 1962 dollars. If I if this channel was around back in 1962, this channel's income would be higher than the cost of one M60 main battle tank uh, every year. We could build the arsenal of democracy, but unfortunately, inflation's the thing. So you know. Yeah, of course. Uh, and yeah, America has a lot of equipment. The thing is that supplying Ukraine with proper equipment now would actually put a strain on the amount of equipment that even America has because uh, the thing is a lot of the really hyper modern equipment is there for a reason it's because America is worried about you know certain threats uh, all over the world you know uh, and now especially now with what's happening in Russia they'll be far less willing to send a lot of equipment so i think it's kind of indicative that it's a hodgepodge of equipment from all over, uh, you know, Europe that's that's coming into uh, into Ukraine, and it will actually take a little bit of meticulous planning and time that we don't really have, so that so that like uh, a proper logistical chain and a proper proper standardized equipment is given to Ukraine, because right now we've sent everything under the sun, you know, to the Ukrainians. So <laughs> we need to be sending stuff that they can service and stuff that's standard. Not 12 different types of tank, send one tank. Yeah. Not 12 different types of artillery in small numbers, send one type, send a lot of shells. And precision weapons are good. They're sending the Atakams now. They're sending more Himars. That's good. They should keep that up. But don't expect that to like single-handedly change the war. They will need the heavy weapons to actually push back the Russians from their entrenched positions. Because you can bomb a position all you want, eventually you'll have to go take it. Yeah, we need to give them 50,000 M60 Patton main battle tanks and all the associated ammunition and repair parts. And we just need to give that to them. I'm sure it's easy to figure out. You know, they were made in 1960. And it'll be... Yeah, dude. Yeah. Yeah, Perfect. <laughs> yeah it'll, it'll last. It's fine. It's good. I, um, uh, I really do appreciate you coming on, you know. Oh, uh, thanks. I, I, I'm really happy to come on as well. Uh, I, w I want to say to the chat, you've been excellent hosts. Um, you can, of course, uh, look at my, uh, let, let me stop uh, streaming so you can see my beautiful face. Uh, but you can find me on Twitch and, and Twitter. Uh, you can find me on Twitch at uh, twitch.tv Richie Haney because Richard Haney was taken. Uh, and then on Twitter, uh, Richie, Richard Haney 17. So let me close that. Uh, basically, yeah, thank you very much for having me on, and any other time you guys want to talk about something relating to history, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, political history stuff, I'm pretty good at that, you know? Uh, <laughs> I, I have, uh, especially about Greece, you know, and the Greek Civil War, stuff like that, that a lot of people don't really know about. Uh, I think I have some information that might be applicable to even politics in the United States, you know? Uh, a lot of 
I, I'll be very brief on this, but I saw that speech that Kamala Harris was given. Uh, what was it? Uh, it was um, it was about uh, the end of Roe v. Wade. You know about you know oh our hands are tied. Really, yes, yes, yes. Uh, her the, her weakness. Yeah. Political engagement here in Greece is, is gonna it would blow the minds of all the hoity-toity like uh, politicians that I see in the United States. You know, people that, I, I, like I, the way I watch the January six hearings as well. Like people talking about you know going on always on a preamble about you know the greatness of America, the the essence of the truth of the whatever the hell. Uh, they they do this whole thing about about America. Uh, and it, Greek politics, everything is everything like blows up here. People yell at each other in Parliament. Uh, like Molotov cocktails are thrown. There's there's there there are riots and violence. And I see people talking about political engagement and what what can and cannot be done. And I'm like, oh, a lot more can be done. Like I I, I won't I I won't <laughs> talk about like specifically, but a lot of stuff can happen in politics. Oh, well, People... American politicians are, are, well, I should say Democrats are enormous pussies. Republicans do lots of cool shit. They try, like, to initiate coups, and yeah. they, they implicitly encourage their voter base to assassinate political opponents. You know, Republicans are having fun. Democrats are the, uh, the lazy ones. I think Republicans have sort of, sort of figured out that if you're, if you're playing a football game between, and I will use the, the European football, okay, the, a soccer game, between two teams, right? And it, the the Republicans figured out that they can just pick up the ball and walk to the enemy uh, soccer, uh, the enemy the enemy goalpost the of the Democrats and just put the ball in there, and the Democrats will go, "Oh my God, I can't believe it!" Okay, let's score this for you guys, but but next time you need to respect the rules. If you're playing in a soccer game. Both teams need to respect the rules, or there's no it's no longer a soccer game anymore. You're playing a different game. You're playing a game of uh of power politics at that point. And people need to recognize that, I think. Because goddamn, seeing people try to play by the rules that the other team ignores is kind of sad. <laughs> if if you get what I mean. No, I, I, I completely know. get what you mean. I'm sure I'm sure that eventually the finger wagging and hand waving from the Democrats will um, discourage Republicans from doing the thing that gets them political power. Uh, we just yeah. have to wait. Eventually they'll fall in line. <laughs> yeah, eventually they they'll they'll understand. You know, uh, and at least history will absolve the Democrats after the Republican junta falls. Uh, in the 2040s. Yeah, uh, all right, all right. Folk, okay, worry about your own goddamn <laughs> Turkey invasion, okay? Listen, you... Yes, I don't want to end up in the front line. I will keep worrying about that, as I was worrying, like, throughout uh, 2020. So, yeah, don't worry. I'm worrying about that. <laughs> okay, we'll guard Washington. You guard Cyprus. We'll do the best we of can. Of course. I, thank you very <laughs> much for coming on. Uh, my pleasure. Again, you can find me at uh, at Richard Haney seventeen on Twitter and at twitch.tv slash Richie Haney. Uh, and anytime you guys can come on and you can anything anything you want to talk about, I'm here. All right. And now also Vosh, you can follow me on Twitter because I I will surpass a thousand followers for sure after this. Yeah, where so, uh, I'll be follow worthy. Chat link it. <laughs> chat link it i'm not typing it out oh my god uh, so funny there we go yeah well you have to set a standard otherwise christ you you have to follow yeah. everyone oh no 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 yeah i i completely understand especially like you know some so such a big size yeah wait all right how are you how are you 21 with a bachelor's uh because it was a three it was a four-year degree with a year in industry uh and the year in industry was cut because of COVID, so it was three years, and I started in 2019, and now it's 2022. So I finished in 2021. Uh, it was from when I was uh, nine at 18 to when I was 21. Huh. I have my birthday really soon on well 3rd done. Of August. Well done, yeah, and happy 22. almost birthday. Thank you. You have a wonderful day. All right. You too, you too. I will. Uh, it's 11 here. I'm going to, well, 1240 at night. But go, yeah, go sleep. Go sleep. Of my night. 
I'm going to be celebrating. Don't worry. <laughs> don't have any nightmares got, about uh, the Ottoman Empire. And have I a good one. I got this, uh, this oh. weird uh, thing we used to strip paint with. Um, it's Tsipuro. Uh, that thing will kill people. So The classic uh, Mediterranean I'll, I'll... dish. Yes, of course. <laughs> All right. Talk to you have soon. Have a good one. And be well. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.